Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for attending our session today. Uh, my name is Peter Margaris with uh, Palo Alto Networks, and we're excited to have you join us today. We're going to talk about security. And uh, we have a, a great lineup of speakers today, and we're going to keep it moving uh, at a pretty good rapid pace. Uh, I have, in addition to myself, obviously, uh, Lenny Burakovsky. Lenny leads our product management organization, uh, developing service provider solutions in particular. And uh, Greg Day is here with us. Greg is our chief security officer in our EMEA region. Patrick Donegan from Harden Stance. Patrick's the founder and, and, uh, and principal analyst, one of the uh, leading industry analysts over the past uh, decade or so in, uh, in mobile network security in particular. And uh, Rupesh Chakshi is from AT&T. AT&T is one of our close partners, and uh, Rupesh is here uh, representing AT&T Business. And uh, let me get started. So um, let's talk briefly about the dynamics at play which are driving uh, security in many ways, especially from a mobile networks perspective. Around uh, the, the convention, you've seen all the talk about 5G and IoT. Uh, 5G networks are evolving and evolving quickly, so mobile network operators are moving their networks as fast as possible to add more capacity, to be able to support all these new exciting services. The Internet of Things, everybody knows about that. It's, it's continuing to expand. Uh, LTE connected devices are, are still nascent, but, but expanding very rapidly. We're seeing a lot of trends with regard to different types of application-oriented threats that are making their way to mobile users. We also are seeing Android devices in particular. There's more and more Android exploits that are, uh, that are popping up. So uh, in addition to, obviously, Windows, uh, Windows uh, exploits have been around for a long time. But mobile devices, and especially Android, are beginning to uh, accelerate at a rapid pace we also, with, the, with regard to networks, these service providers are building out uh, these complex networks with separate data plane and separate application plane uh, network architectures. And what that's doing is it's opening up some threat vectors there as well. And um, we also have an increasing number of these networks, these advanced LTE networks, these 4G and 5G networks, that are connecting and interconnecting where many users are now roaming across these networks from all, all over the world. So all these dynamics at play are introducing uh, a great number of security challenges and uh, basically requiring all of us to look at this whole thing differently in terms of how do we secure these, uh, these evolutions over time. So what we've seen is um, obviously uh, we've seen hackers and, and and bad actors that have taken advantage of this. And these, these bad actors are highly automated. So they have advanced equipment. They have advanced techniques. They're morphing uh, their tactics. And they're morphing the way that they uh, take advantage of these exploits that I mentioned. And what that's requiring now is completely new tools, completely new tools that service providers need to deploy in these networks and also new tools that enterprise customers need to deploy on their premises as well. So there's a multitude of things here to stay ahead of these attackers, to get ahead of them, and to continue to stay ahead of them as these evolutions continue to take place. What we've seen is this. We've seen these networks evolving and evolving very rapidly. We've seen, obviously, going from 3G to 4G, we've seen these, these, uh, these mobile networks uh, deploy SDN and NFV technologies, virtualized uh, uh, functions within their networks. They're deploying telco cloud services. They're moving very rapidly to 5G. All of these evolutions have one, uh, or one thing in common. These network operators are, are racing to create more capacity, lower latency, uh, add more services, add more applications, add more users, add more devices. But what's, uh, what's happened is security within the realm of that has lagged, and there's a lot of legacy technologies out there. So there's a gap that continues to increase as these evolutions take place. So what are we, uh, what are we faced with in terms of uh, uh, from a network perspective, also from an enterprise and an, and an endpoint perspective? You see 
that these technologies that are legacy, that have been out there, continue to be out there, provide limited visibility. So you can't really see what's happening. You can't see these threats, these advanced threats that are, that are uh, continuing to evolve. You also have a lack of automation. So it's, it's making it more difficult for organizations, service providers and enterprises to stay ahead of the game. When you have lack of automation, then what you need to do is add a lot of bodies. You have to add a lot of resources. You have to look at a lot of data. And that doesn't always work out well in terms of finding some of these threats. And, uh, and then it's also more difficult to consume new innovations. So when you look at the adversary we talked about that's very automated and very sophisticated, if you can't consume new innovations, if you can't evolve your networks, if you can't evolve your, your security technologies rapidly, then it's a tough game for you to, uh, to stay ahead. So um, with that, I wanted to introduce uh, our first speaker for today, Greg Day. Greg is our uh, VP and Chief Security Officer. And um, Greg's going to talk about um, how we ingest data in terms of our security platform, what that means, how we ingest the data, and then analyze it, and then create new protections for networks and for customers. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Peter. Now, I know he was worried whether I was going to make it through the uh, British snowy weather, um, so he was ready to stand in and, and cover for me. Um, <clears throat> I feel like he's done the, the bit that I always try not to do, which is to make the sound all scary and, and bad. Uh, and the simple reality is we've been dealing with cyber adversaries now for, what, 30 years? I think, as Peter mentioned, though, the challenge now is, is we see different technologies converging. IoT, um, you know, Industry 4.0, 5G. What we're seeing is a lot of the techniques that we've been used to dealing with over the last two, three decades moving into these new environments. And so I just want to spend a few minutes kind of giving you a few examples of those shifts, how we actually get visibility, and, and some things we, we're going to be doing to solve that problem in the future. Maybe just as a, as a quick reference point, um, we talk about automation. And, and I think it's really easy to kind of say, you know, attacks are more automated. But to kind of conceptualize, what does that really mean? Let me give you just one quick example. Um, so, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be interactive here. So how many of you have heard of ransomware? How many of you don't know what I'm saying? It's always good to check. We had a lot of different languages in the room. So I think everybody has heard ransomware in the news, the idea of something comes to your system and encrypts your personal data and makes you pay money to get it back. So one attack campaign we follow at the minute is something called RanRan. And RanRan, every three seconds, dynamically recompiles itself, changes its code, so the thing that you're used to detecting and blocking with your antivirus or other tools can no longer detect it. Think about it. Every three seconds, it changes itself. That is the kind of automation that we're dealing with today. So um, let me talk a little bit about um, you know, how we gather this data. And, and I'm going to come back to this more at the end. But the, the key part of this is when I started in the cybersecurity industry, cyber attacks are really simple. They're made up of just an executable, a binary, a, a singular object. But as our IT world has become more complex, we've seen that the, the cyber attack become more complex. Some bits, for example, one of the trends I'd seen over the last couple of years was, how do I tie social engineering into a cyber attack? If I can get something onto your CEO or your CFO's phone to track where they are, then what I do is I wait till they're in the sky on a flight for 12 hours, and I send an email from the CFO into the finance team saying, we've got this overdue payment. It needs to be paid right now, otherwise we're going to be fined. So what do you do if you're in doubt of that? You'd call him to check. Then you realize he's in the sky for 12 hours. So now you have to make the decision. So part of being able to deal with today's threat is actually being able to join together information, whether it's something that's on your physical network, whether it's something over your 5G network, whether it's something on a, on a smart device. We've got to be able to join those bits of information together. So how do we do that? And what are the things we're actually gathering? And the, the data I'm going to show you in a sec has really come from all of those different points. Um, it comes from traditional endpoint devices, whether you've got a Mac, a PC, or anything else. We're gathering information from there. Because you know, you think about it, how often do you go to the App Store on your, uh, you know, your Mac? to download things. How often do you go to uh, a marketplace to download things? So one of the things we have to do is to not kind of silo. Make sure we can see those different information flows. 
it may be actually that we've put some threat prevention actually on your device, something like your Android phone. We have a technology called Traps, and that's actually looking real time to see what these threats are. More and more in the business space, there may be some sort of tunnel going back of secure communication between your device and the business, some sort of VPN client. And uh, for us, that would be uh, Global Protect, and you're probably using some sort of MDM, mobile device management solution, where your security teams are making sure that you've got a decent password, you've not jailbroken your device, et cetera. So all of these things have to interact. So whether it's information coming from your smart device or your IoT device, whether it's coming from your physical systems or it's actually up there on the, the network communication points, whether that's tying into some of the mobile protocols or more traditional IP protocols, we gather all of those different artifacts together and we send them up into the cloud. We send them into the cloud because we are dealing with terabytes and terabytes of data every single day. Last time I did the maths on it, we were adding in about 300 threats per second. I'm sure that number's gone, gone further north since then. So we have this point in the cloud to be able to do all of that cross analysis to understand what this is. And here's the key bit. We have to use automation just as much as the adversary does. When I started in the industry, I started as a researcher. It used to be lovely. We'd get a threat sample come in, and those five of us out in the team would go, nah, I'll take this one. And for the next three or four days, I'd reverse engineer it, and I'd understand it. And it was really nice. I'd stop for coffee. Um, now, 99.9% .9 of it we do through technology. That's the only way we can keep pace with this. So this is kind of, I want to just set the scene. If you want to see what's going on in the world, what do you do? You listen. You listen to what's going out there. And we have about 45,000 customers around the world that we gather this data up from. So that's important just as some context for what I want to show you now. So what does the landscape look like? Well, I've literally just taken here from 1st of December through to, to mid-February, kind of that last three-month period, just to give you a flavor. And the first thing, not unsurprisingly, you see there is this kind of pretty graph at the top that just kind of goes up and down. And here's the reality. Adversaries will put together an idea. We call it a campaign. Uh, and I'm going to show you one in a minute, a, a banking trojan. So if you think about it, um, cyber, if you like, attack, generally falls into traditionally two buckets. They either want to make money directly from you, I want your banking details, or I want your credit card details, because they can monetize that very quickly. Or they want your credentials or information about you. So if I can get your credentials, I can get into your email, I can get other people to do things. If I can get your credentials, I can get into your OneDrive or your Google Box or whatever other store points and take your data. Now I've got IP, and I can sell that IP. And we see in the most sophisticated cases things like pump and dump, uh, uh, pump and dump stock schemes where you go, I can steal the trading plans for business, their profitability, and capture the market before it goes public. So these spikes you see are different campaigns going on. And actually, very interesting, we've seen a very slight downtrend in the last couple of months. But I'd be honest and say that's kind of not typical. Um, you can see kind of the volumes there, um, half a million samples coming from 600,000 sessions. And ignore those numbers. They're kind of irrelevant. They're just big. What's interesting, though, is the correlation. So just about every attack we see is unique. It's some sort of twist or change off the next version. So what we see is lots of creativity and changing of flavors. How is it coming to us? Well, most commonly, web browsing. That's the most common thing in web protocols across just about every everything we use, all the different devices. Behind that, FTP, uh, Mediafire, if you've not come across this, is a uh, document sharing tool. So again, it's an easy way to kind of proliferate, put yourself in a public place that everybody else gets access to. And then the industries that were targeted, um, honestly, kind of you can see at the minute their wholesale was at the top. If I'd run this report three months earlier, actually education was higher. So again, what we see is the adversary will kind of spend some time and go, where is there something that I can monetize? And I will focus on that as long as I can till I'm successful. So what I want to do, uh, it probably seems like a long time ago. Anyone remember Christmas? That like now seems like forever ago. God, it's depressing, isn't it? Like I had a nice break, and the world's carried on since then. Um, I want to share with you uh, an example of that kind of first side of the spectrum here. Um, so 
I'm not going to ask you, but I'm sure many of you in times gone by maybe have been a victim of some sort of credit card fraud. So, you know, if you think about it now, less and less are we using our credit cards, and what are we doing instead? We're doing touchless payments. And what are you doing it with? You're doing it with your smartphone or with your iWatch or other devices. So you think about it from the criminal perspective. If you move the way you do transactions from you know, physical money into online banking, and now more and more into touchless payments, what does the adversary do? They're going to follow you there. So BankBot, I just thought it's a nice example to show you. This literally we saw appear in December, and it was that uptick over Christmas. Hey, guess what? What do we all do around Christmas? We spend lots of money buying presents, going out, doing things. So the adversary releases an attack around that period. And so really interesting here, you can see it focused in very much on the service industry, because what else do we all do around Christmas? We travel. And actually, one of the things I said on the Europol advisory board to look at cybercrime on the broader scale, one of the real focus areas we've seen is offline payment systems. So if you're on a plane and you're buying something, or in the airport and you're buying something, it's these quick, uh, high volume, uh, you know, low, if you like, transactional check payments. So we saw this came out. Um, if you went to a very broad spectrum of nefarious sites, what does that mean? Just a less than genuine site, um, either intentionally or mistakenly, then it would compromise you. Uh, it would compromise you by what we call self-infection. You actually infect yourself. And you'd probably think, hold on, who would be daft enough to infect themselves? Well, the simple part of this is it would look like a genuine application. It might look like a, uh, an update to Flash Player. It might be a, uh, your first free Bitcoin. Anybody get caught up in the Bitcoin hype? How many of you bought Bitcoins? If you get one for free, how cool would that be? So it was offering you something that looks genuine, but actually what it was doing was installing an overlay onto your banking app. So every time you did a banking transaction with your online app, absolutely would function and enable and work normally as it should do. But imagine kind of having somebody sat on your shoulder, and every time you're putting in your credentials or in your authentication, it's involved in that process. So it could take a copy of those and could also redirect additional payments off into a different direction. So I think we're just going to see more and more of that as we go to using our smart devices as our primary form of payment in the next few years. Then I kind of come back to the other one. So the other thing I talked about is espionage or credential theft. And uh, Henbox is another campaign that we had looked at over the last few months. And again, this was really interesting for me for, for that kind of transition from the traditional world, kind of computer viruses, into smart device attacks. Because this was an author that actually isn't that smart. He had been traditionally in the PC space and used tools, for example, like you'll see at the end there, Poison Ivy is a malware generation toolkit. So for any of you that want a career change, I wouldn't encourage this, but you can go online and buy toolkits that will create attacks for you. So all the work was done for them. But now what they've done is to take that knowledge and that skill, <clears throat> move it into the Android space. Again, masking as genuine apps, a VPN client, a, uh, a news feed service, a backup agent. And again, just like the banking apps, they would generally do those things. Otherwise, you'd go, hey, what's going on? But this was being hosted in the lo local regional app stores. And as a part of you then installing that, Actually, then, what would happen is it would get some communication back from specific IoT devices that would enable it now to go into listen mode and start tracking sensitive data. That might be your profile of how you go to work, might be the kind of calls you make on your phone, might be the emails you send. So any of that sensitive data they were using from that device to gain if you like, intellectual property or espionage information. Now, I thought one more. So kind of I've talked really about kind of like the, you know, the, you know, what we see going over kind of smart devices and how it spreads. The other end of the spectrum is kind of the IoT space, the machine to machine or the machine to, to user. And I think back since 2016, we saw Mirai. And if you're not aware, one of the challenges that we kind of have today is there are so many IoT devices that go out there. And when these are developed, security isn't the first thought. So what we all too often see is a new IoT device goes out, and it has a default username and password. And so what Mirai did was, the, the, if you like, the author behind this gathered up 
about 60 of these default username and passwords from a number of different vendor organizations and then built this botnet attack. And literally all it will do is to go out and say, right, let me look for what I think is an IoT device. Then I'm going to query that device to see what kind of device it is. And if it's on my list, now I've got the username and password already because this company hadn't thought enough about security up front that I could compromise them. And then I could use that device to go attack others. And if you remember the Dyn attack, uh, you might have seen this big denial of service about a year ago. That was done using uh, the Mirai botnets, all of these IoT devices. And there are millions of them out there to compromise. Well, there's kind of good news and bad news in this one. The original author behind Mirai was actually caught and arrested over a year ago. The bad news is, as soon as he published Mirai, he posted all of the source code on GitHub. GitHub, for those of you that are in this space, is an open source library for developers to share source code. So it was basically kind of like this Christmas present said, hey, everybody else, here is my botnet. Go reuse it. So we've seen flavor after flavor of this. Um, some of them we've seen looking at other bits of hardware. We saw them focusing on things like Huawei routers and some other brands in more recent times. And actually, even more recently, we've started to see them move into uh, to other spaces, um, for example, trying to hijack into cryptocurrency mechanisms. And I guess that's the last thing I want to just leave you with in that kind of cyber threat space. I talked a bit about Bitcoin. But again, if I look at things like Ethereum, uh, you know, as we keep moving forward, we get to that point where we go, actually, do I really want any form of physical currency, or am I now going to use digital currency, cryptocurrency? So we're already now starting to see, we've seen examples of uh, exploits in the protocols behind that. And let me ask you this, um, you know, when you start to think about digital currencies, what's the natural thought that comes behind that? What do you, what's the thing that everybody is talking about? What's the application? Yeah, what's the application behind it? But I think the other bit for me is, um, you know, we get into this whole idea of digital ledgers. You know, I have this distributed ledger mentality where the transaction is stored in multiple places, and then if somebody breaks the transaction, then I'm going to know about it, and we find for fraud faster. But what about if there's a vulnerability in that system? Now that means they can do a genuine transaction, and I haven't broken the ledger. So actually what we're starting to see is we move again forward in technology, the adversary going, how do I find ways around that? We've seen them use social engineering. Um, before one cryptocurrency was launched, the day before we saw an adversary spoof emails out going, this is where you go to buy it. This is how you transact and trade in it. But in fact, it was a bogus replica. So we will continue to see cyber criminals follow the money as we go more and more digital. So let me bring this back to, so what do we do to solve this problem? Well, the challenge we've faced right since the dawn of time is the threat keeps changing. It's kind of, for me, the bit that makes this a really interesting space. Every day is a different day. So we started off traditionally listening into communications. And the goal for us is really a couple of things. You know, if we can't see what's going on, how do you see if something is good or bad? And the same applies whether I'm on a physical IP connection, whether I'm on you know, traditional GPRS, going back eons in time now, or whether I'm on a 5G network. If I can't listen into that network, then how do I actually see what's going on? Now, the next part of that is, as I said earlier, the attacks have got far more sophisticated. Um, anybody remember, any of you have one of these? You can buy a cool new version, by the way, the Rubik's Cube. Anyone ever have a Rubik's Cube? A few of you? Anybody solve it without using a screwdriver, by the way? That doesn't count. So, you know, think the Rubik's Cube. Why do I mention this? The Rubik's Cube is really simple. You know, you've got six sides, nine squares. How hard could it be? There are 43 quintillion permutations to solve the Rubik's Cube. Now, today, we have cyber threats that are made up of different components that do reconnaissance. Then they figure out how they get to you, and there's lots of different ways of that. Then, actually, how do they get the permissions? Do they steal them? Do they break them? Then they actually have to install something to function. And then, typically, they'll communicate back through some sort of hidden protocol. So cyber attacks are like a Rubik's Cube. There are multiple different facets to it. Now, to give you a different analogy, um, anyone remember doing a jigsaw puzzle? 
If I gave you a 100-piece jigsaw puzzle and I said, turn over one piece, now you tell me what the picture is. Do you think you'd be able to do it? Probably not. But that's the challenge we face in cybersecurity. So we've got all of these bits of the puzzle, and we have different tools. We have antivirus, we have IPS, we have content filtering, URL inspection, all these different things that try and find pieces of the puzzle. But the challenge has always been, the only way I really see the adversary is to join those pieces together. Otherwise, it's kind of like second guess, blind man's bluff. And especially in the telco space, there's nothing worse than blocking or dropping traffic that isn't the real problem. That's a great way to burn trust. So you've got to have the confidence to see what's going on. So the kind of first evolution of good cybersecurity, and this is something we've been doing for about a decade, is the idea of concurrency. You've got to be able to see these different artifacts at the same time, and if you can't join them together, you're second guessing. And what do we do when we second guess? We give it to a human. And the human then has to make a decision. I tell you, I, I have a SOC team that works for me, and wow, the pressure on that. Get it wrong, you're in trouble with the business. So we have to give them the right tools to enable that. Now, how do we do that? We join all those bits together. And one of the most important things, and I'm going to leave it for, for Leonard to talk in a minute about, but we're really excited about is, is we have that visibility, the scope of what we need to look at will continue to grow. And he's going to talk a bit about that, especially things like support for things like GTP. So I get on to kind of the second evolution. And the second evolution is, well, where do you apply cybersecurity? Well, it used to be easy. I put it on my PC. And then I started to put it on my data center, my server. Now, actually, what do I put it on? I put it on my smart device. Do I put it in my connected car? Do I put it in my uh, you know, manufacturing plant? Or do I put it in the cloud? And the answer is, the more of those different places, the bigger of the picture I can see. But I think about what's happening in the cloud world. And it's a fundamental shift for me that I think IT is becoming more and more disposable. You know, it used to be, I remember buying my very first phone, and I had it for like two years, that same phone. How many of you have kept your last phone for two years? A few of you, probably about a third of you. At the time that we keep devices is getting shorter and shorter, and the cloud is a great example. Last year, Azure announced per minute billing. What happened after that? AWS came back and said, we're going to do per second billing. You think about everything we do, we're trying to reduce the costs, give better service. So why do we not do the same in cybersecurity? Why do we not separate away the expensive CapEx bit, you know, the hardware, the infrastructure, and move it into the cloud just the same as we remove all of our other resources and put it into a subscription model. So it brings me on to really, I think, kind of the second and third evolutions we've gone through. The second was consistency. The only way I really see what's going on is to join together that information flow from end to end, whether that's a, a car back to the dealership, whether that's car back to the manufacturers trying to understand faults, whether that's a smartphone to a Fitbit, I need to see more of the information to have a better view of the problem. And the third evolution for me is consumption. Because everything we do in IT effectively gets cheaper. You look at it, Moore's law, exponentially the cost halves and halves and halves every year, if not greater, and the compute power grows. So we need to be able to do the same with cybersecurity, change the model in which we actually consume cybersecurity. So that brings me back to the starting point. And this is where we see the world going. You know, the good news for me, there's what, about 7.5 billion on the planet? Maybe half a percent are bad. It's a very small percentage. Now, you think about it. If we all work individually to try and spot what's bad, it's kind of one against a few cyber criminals. If we all group together, now you've got 7 billion people trying to spot the bad, we massively turn the table. But to do that, we have to change a few things. One is we need to have this concurrency of all of the different artifacts of what's bad. I need to see that traffic in the relevant places, whether it is in mobile data protocols, whether it's in IoT protocols. I need to be able to understand that to see the adversary. What I then need to be able to do is to join together the different artifacts 
And the cloud is the perfect space. We have the compute power to gather and store that data, not just what's happening now, but what happened last week, last month, last year. But what I then need is the smart big data algorithms. Because every year, every month, there is something new coming out in cybersecurity, a new smarter way to spot the adversary. And so what we kind of launched recently from a Palo Alto Networks perspective was the idea of putting together a framework, a framework that allowed different startup organizations, different mature security organizations to all have a place to be able to gather and consolidate the intelligence of what's going on and then apply their own smart algorithms against that to then be able to drive outcomes. Different places of being able to enforce actions against that with confidence. If I can put together 80, 90% of the jigsaw, now I see a lot of what's going on, and I have the confidence to take an action. If I've got two pieces, then I see very little of what's going on. So these are just a few of the partners that we have already working with us today. It's a pretty cool ecosystem that spans from the cloud into threat intelligence sources, into smart networks, into the mobile space, IoT, and beyond. And if I kind of maybe simplify it down, you know, we look at this from you know, what are the really strategic places that we need to apply cybersecurity? What are the different technology partners that we need to achieve that with? And what are the different network communication points that we need to apply that within? So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. And um, one final thing before I pass over, two final things. One is. Uh, you'll see on a lot of your chairs is a leaflet. Uh, we put together a, a, a broader, if you like, bit of research around uh, you know, what are the mobile threats. And actually, what you've got on your chair is the URL that you can download that. I thought rather than give you yet more paper to take home, uh, you could download this at your own leisure. Um, the second thing I want to point you to is uh, this is a great book for yourself or your executive peers, Navigating the Digital Age, which has been written by uh, experts at a, at a board level, experts in uh, cyber, experts in incident response, experts in policy and regulation. And it's designed to be that short reference guide that can help your executives get their head around some of the cybersecurity challenges and the questions they should be asking back of their peers in the business.